you. It was, it was nice to meet many of you when I wandered in here a few minutes ago, and, and it's nice to see some old friends who are here to, be, Would you to share this. And it's just great to be here. I really appreciate you, you, uh, you coming. And, and, and I really appreciate John uh, coordinating this. As, as, as he pointed out, I think I heard in the back when I was trying to get my machine set up. Friendly UAV that, uh, online. Yeah, so this is, the, my foundation has co-sponsored this, but basically John's done all the work with his people. And we just helped out a little bit. And so it's great. I hope we'll have a lovely day. Um, in fact, it's such a nice day, we really should go outside instead of being here. But I put this I now, got your back. I, you know, it'd be really neat if this light came off, but probably you can't control it. Um, Loading! There's, there's no, anyway, it doesn't Our UAV matter. is over in um, the area. I put the poem up. Holy mackerel. Okay, good. You can see it. Um, uh, because I was originally getting Richard to read it because he always he loves to, he's so good at reciting poetry. But it's a, it's a, one of my favorite poems from T. S. Eliot, um, from the War Quartets about time. I, I'm going to talk as we think about the about new ways of thinking about the world, which I think is what this is all about. Um, I am going to be talking about my new book, uh, which in the United Kingdom is called The Known Unknowns, and in the United States is called The Edge of Knowledge. This is because of, um, of political correctness. Um, because uh, the known unknowns is a quote from Donald Rumsfeld. And um, my American publishers decided it was inappropriate to have a quote from Donald Rumsfeld uh, on the cover of the book. But I like Edge of Knowledge too. They're both the same thing. What we know, we don't know about the universe. Because that's really what gets science going, as I'll talk about at the, at the end. It's really at the heart of what all of you are about, too. The fact that we're happy to say we don't know. And that's what makes life worth the living, in some sense. So, I thought I'd pick two topics from the book, from the beginning of the book, and the end of the book to talk about. So let's see if you can click forward, if there's anyone there can click forward enough. One of the other quotes I begin the book with is one of my favorite quotes from Richard Feynman. Um, who said, I don't feel frightened not knowing things by Dropping being lost in a mysterious here. universe without any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell. And, and that's the motto. No, that's always, that. always been my motto. And, uh, and the motto of people, I think, who are willing to not have a, a, a ferry in the sky taking care of them. Um, On your the six. fact that it's mysterious and, and, uh, and it's our job to kind of figure out as much as we can about how the universe works. So, uh, next slide. Keep pressing. Okay. Time, which I don't have enough of, apparently. Okay. Keep going. Um, so, I have quotes at the beginning of each chapter about time, but this is one of my favorite ones from Kurt Vonnegut, who happens to be another one of my favorite authors. Here we are, Mr. Pilgrim, trapped in the amber of this moment. There is no why. Taking effective fire! For that many people, including physicists, Ruby. time may be an illusion. And some physicists actually think time is an illusion. Uh, uh, I'm a kind of very Changing mags. basic physicist. So for me, that no, means absolutely nothing. Destroyed. Because what's really important is operational things. Time may be an illusion in some vast sense, but the question is, how does that illusion arise? And while it may be an illusion, if you can go to the next slide. OK, there we go. I just came in on the train, which was running, which was a great success because I, did, I didn't come in yesterday because it wouldn't have been running. Um, but um, this, is, this is in Switzerland where the trains always run. And, um, and time may be an illusion, but if, you, if when I used to, I, I, I lived in Switzerland for a little while and, and, and wrote one of my books there actually. And before my iWatch and iPhone, um, it really, you really could tell your time, by, tell the time by the trains. I live right beside the subway station. And I knew if I, if I was one minute late, the train wouldn't Dropping be there. So I was able to tell the time by the clocks. And in fact, if you are one minute late for a train and you miss it, don't get to work. If I tell you time is an illusion, it's not much solace, right? And so, so time is an amazing part of our existence. But physics has completely changed the picture of time and made it even more mysterious than it was before. I mean, all of us are suffer with the fact that time inexorably moves forward in our lives until it stops for us but continues for other people. And uh, that alone seems to be a tragedy, although in some sense it's just wonderful that we have that brief moment to enjoy that, that period. But, um, but a person who was, who did look, if you look at the next slide, click 
ones. There we go. This is another famous clock. This is, a, this is in Bern, Switzerland. And this is probably close to the view that Albert Einstein had when he was working in the Swiss patent office and thinking and developing his special theory of relativity. And it's not surprising, given back. where he lived and worked, Hostile that UAV he thought about it and he tried to explain Our it UAV using trains. In the area. Which is a, and by the way, trains were essential in the changing the definition of time. In Switzerland, as in many other places, individual cities deployed. used to keep separate times. They all had their own time. But with the advent of trains, especially in continental Europe, trains went fast enough between cities that they had to coordinate and keep the same time. So it was really trains that caused the coordination of time, certainly in Europe. And Einstein thought about electricity and magnetism and came up with, with his special theory of relativity, which said that time is strange. It's not universal. The time depends upon you and what you're doing. And the example he gave was a train. So go to the next slide. So Dropping don't press yet. Here. So th this, this, is, so this is one of his famous examples, just to we give you a sense of how around. weird it is. It so yeah, actually, you can press once, just once, OK, Natalia? There we go. Just don't do anything else. So let's say you're a conductor on that train, going through the train, and you, you want to think that you have clocks throughout the train, and you walk throughout the train and make sure all the clocks are synchronized, so they're all going around like that, OK? And they are synchronized. But if the train is going very fast and you're on the ground looking at that train, you can press again, Natalia, once. There we go. You'll see something very different. First of all, the train will be shorter, but we won't go in there. But secondly, what's really weird is the clocks won't be synchronized. The clock in the front of the train will be ahead of the clock behind the train. And so for an observer on the train, things that are instantaneous, that are simultaneous at the front and back of the train, are no longer simultaneous for someone on the ground. And it's really weird that one person's before can be another person's after. If the, if the events are far That's enough apart, I can say event A happens before event B, and you can say event B happens before event A, and you're both, we're both right. For, for events that are taking place away from either of us, where we are, we always know what's happening. But if we try and assess what the time is, if I try and assess what the time is in, in your audience, um, then, of course, for me,